Welcome, and uh, thank you all for coming. When Faust strikes his deal with Mephistopheles, it is not because he is after material gain or romantic conquest or even power or knowledge. It is an act of defiance. Faust bets that nothing can give him any lasting satisfaction. If to any moment say, I, say if, to, if I to any moment say, linger on, you are so fair, put me in fetters straight away, then I can die for all I care. Goethe transformed the legend of the man who sells his soul to the devil for worldly possessions into its opposite. His drama is a tale of unrest. One is tempted to say ontological unrest. Faust sees as truly diabolical the desire to reach the goal of desire. He embraces striving for its own sake and dares Mephistopheles to find an experience that he would want to hold on to forever. No spoilers. I will only say that Faust's wager with his demon will keep him on the move. And in time, that movement will unfold powers within Faust that he himself is not yet aware of. Yet for Goethe, Faustian striving was an archetypal theme, not only of the human psyche. He beheld the same manic drama throughout the plant and animal realms. The drive to excess, the blind impulse toward a fuller existence that might attain a novel form, he finds these everywhere in the panorama of living things. Indeed, Goethe credited the dynamic urge in the organism with being the true source and origin of species, two generations before Darwin. Applied to nature at large, the Faustian insight called for conjectures about evolution. What is significant about living phenomena, what makes them Faustian even on the surface, is that their vital exuberance outstrips the functions necessary for mere survival. Natural philosophers since Descartes had begun to think of, of the animal as a machine, and that view opened the way to ever more refined technical control over vital processes. But Goethe denied that analysis of the organism into its inorganic elements could shed light on its essential activity. Again, Faust. Whoever wants to know and write about a living thing first drives the spirit out. He has the parts within his grasp, but gone is the spirit's holding clasp. This does not mean that the poet posited an immaterial or supernatural force binding together the material constituents of the organism. For Goethe, one need not posit metaphysical entities in order to study how life appears. The aim of his biological method is to survey organisms' outer expressions and their meaning. His laboratory thus resembles the theater. He called his nature studies morphology, the science of forms, and he thought of himself as nature's show producer. Today we might recognize his work as a kind of phenomenology, setting aside presuppositions of experimental science and describing the life world as it presents itself. We shall take up the question of philosophical method after we become better acquainted with the plays he penned for the plants and animals. Goethe narrates the plant's life in his popular Metamor Metamorphosis of Plants of 1790. The book is well known enough to be subject to a misconception, namely that it argues that all is leaf. The sepals, the segments making up the calyx, the corolla uh, or flower petals, the nectaries and reproductive parts are all transformed leaves, reshaped for various functions. Charles Darwin speaks of this doctrine of the versatile leaf as familiar to almost everyone. But this doctrine actually preceded Goethe. It is what he does with it that is noteworthy. He shows how metamorphosis entails continual qualitative change, a heightening, heightening of existence, 
rather than simple augmentation. The leafy form elements display a progressive direction of movement, an overall striving toward the flowering stage. He devotes a whole chapter to what can be seen in many garden plants, that the leaves ascend the stem, as the leaves ascend the stem, they become more developed, more richly veined and notched, more elaborate in pattern. So if you look at um, number one, your plate one, that's a little diagram from a f contemporary French botanist of Goethe, so you get the idea. This ascending differentiation depends on the refinement of the plant's saps, but the fluid distillation within its vessels is only the correlate of the outer flowering of form, not its sufficient cause. Irregularities in the growth process reveal how one overarching drive crosses through the mere functionality of plant organs. A leaf sometimes anticipates a component higher up the stem. For example, the calyx, the cup that holds the floral corolla, is ordinary, ordinarily green, but it can take on the coloring of the petals above, quote, at the tips, margins, back, or even over its inner surface, while the outer surface remains green. A refinement of form is always associated with this coloration." End quote. Goethe cites cases where a leaf sequence comes to embody a functional appendage, an actual organ, only by degrees. So look at plate two. The compressed leaves of the marigold require one or more attempts before making a proper coat for a fertile seed. As form elements, leaves are not always reducible to one function, for they also express the whole motion, the continuity in the upward striving. A bizarre occurrence is not uncommon in the tulip genus. A leaf on the stem below the calyx can raise itself up to participate in the flowering pattern of the crown. And that's the third, I think that's our third picture there. You can color that in at home, I guess. You, um, he describes such a leaf petal, quote, half green and divided into two parts, the green half being related to the stem and the colored part lifted up to join the corolla. In a weird way, this leaf overreaches itself, yet it preserves the distinct zones of leaves versus flower as it bridges the two. The metamorphosis of plants shows not just the hidden identity of the plant's parts, but the Faust-like urge pressing beyond its own vegetative activity as the parts successively appear. Foliar growth is progressively modified. Simple repetition is left behind as the plant approaches the goal of reproduction. In an experimental paper, Goethe showed that he could interfere with the leaves normal elaboration. He could arrest the development from node to node simply by detaching each new shoot and replanting it in the soil. By decomposing the whole, he could demonstrate that the original composed form embodies a developmental impulse. The higher grade of life entails an imperative to evolve. What is responsible for this transformation up the stem? Goethe was struck by the alternating sequence of expansions and contractions, so simple that it is usually overlooked. Expanded leaves, contracted sepals, expanded petals, contracted sexual organs, expanded fruiting organs. What latent forces struggle back and forth to produce this rhythmic ascent? On the physical side, he could discern a division in the plant's main tissues, the spiral vessels on the periphery, and the vertical fiber in the interior, the circular and the straight, a primal opposition. He proposed that these two tissues are but the material expression of male and female principles, already at work behind the scenes. What engenders the individual's development is, is this dialectical exchange between male and female poles, well before the, male and female become embodied in separate sexual organs where their creative power is manifest. A latent sexual contest within the individual urges 
forward its maturation. The plant resembles the unripe Faust, who complains early on in his story, two souls, alas, abide within my breast. Arrested development, sexual latency. Is the reader of the metamorphosis drawn into the anthropomorphic fallacy, projecting human psychological experience onto the plant? Is that what the poet is doing? Depicting nature as a mirror of man's soul? Or is it the other way around? Is he uncovering essential principles in living things as they operate at more primary levels of expression prior to their appearance in the human being? In that case, his effect is to undo the Cartesian separation of spirit from matter. Goethe inaugurates an anti-dualist revolution on the premise that all living things are analogous and intimately related. As we turn to his treatment of animals, however, his focus will not be on the individual and sexuality, but on how form in higher beings is built up or emerges from lower beings. For him, metamorphosis is the veritable logic of life. It applies not only to the stages of an individual's growth, which one observes in weeks or years, but also to changes across millions of generations that diminish our observation time scale to insignificance. A plant's transformation is obvious. Evolution, however, is the silent transformation that no one directly observes. First, Goethe notes a fundamental similarity of the animal type to the plant. We're turning to animals now. In their rudimentary stages, as egg cells, plant and animal are scarcely distinguishable. Only they have taken opposing courses of development. Plants toward fixity and stability, animals toward mobility and freedom. In both cases, development is founded on a repetition of elements. In, in plants, it is the leaves or nodes along the stem. In animals, it is the serial processes, like the vertebrae and the skeleton, or the segmented body of insects and crustaceans that are transformed. Um, so look at plate four and five. These are Goethe's drawings that sh show this kind of sequencing um, in, a, in a humble animal. Um, and that sequencing is known as serial homology, that repetition of parts. The animal is differentiated beyond the production of like components. Its transformation admits of degree. Quote, the more imperfect a creature is, the more do these parts appear identical or similar to each other, and the more do they resemble the whole. The more the creature is perfected, the more dissimilar its parts become. Subordination of parts to the new whole betokens a more perfect being." End quote. In vertebrates, the repetition of segments could in principle extend indefinitely. The bones of the tail, the caudal vertebrae, suggest to Goethe, quote, the infinity of organic existence, end quote. The snake is mostly tail. The countless vertebrae of its skeleton taper off toward a vanishing point. I was surprised to learn recently, pythons have around 600 vertebrae. A cohesive structure then supervenes upon the repetitive growth to yield other reptile shapes. The snake's transformation into the long-legged frog, as Goethe sees it, is a literal curtailment. The indefinite horizontal energy is redirected vertically and concentrated. The, super, the supervening configurations make up the vertebrate classes, fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, and mammal. Their skeletal patterns constitute what have been known since Aristotle as anatomical types. Now in pre-Darwinian zoology, the typological approach got mixed up with a belief in Platonic ideas and with Christianity, projecting the types as original ideas of the creator. Gradually, as the fossil record was filled out, it revealed primordial ancestors, their earliest mammal, the first fish, and so on, that might replace the abstract types and their miraculous creation. <clears throat> 
But the evolutionists cannot do away with typological inquiry. Goethe collected hundreds of fossil specimens from the deposits around Weimar. But he understood that relating forms in time, as well as in space, depends on the mind's recognition of stable patterns as relative points of departure for transformation. For him, the osteological types were a practical tool, a visual lexicon that has nothing to do with a metaphysics of fixed ideas. Thinking evolution and the relative stability of an archetype go hand in hand. So Goethe says, like the fictional Faust, whatever type is embodied in an animal species, it can never rest but must change, thanks to the tension of forces within and without. Quote, what is formed is instantly transformed. If we would arrive to some degree at a vital intuition of nature, we must strive to keep ourselves as flexible and pliable as the example she provides, end quote. The statement is non-committal about the genealogical descent of species. Not because descent hasn't occurred to Goethe, but because that is a secondary consideration, an interpretation, an inference. Near the end of the metamorphosis of plants, after establishing the prototypical biography for plants, he derives the compound flowers by an act of imaginative gathering. He hints at how one might rethink all the Linnaean genera with the ideal of a real successive trans transformation. He is also curious about botanical monsters, so-called, as if to ask, do these deviants have a future as new species? Do they express life's compulsion to explore new possibilities. And so it is with the animal type. It cannot remain fixed. It cannot help but evolve into a multiplicity of genera. But to think the common descent of species, one must first do the visual thought experiment. So if you look at plate 7a, that's, that's from a manuscript of Goethe. Um, you see he's He's drawing all the, all the skulls carefully and, and correlating their parts. Um, Goethe said famously, people should draw more and talk less. Um, historians are in doubt about whether to count Goethe as a proper predecessor of Darwin. It is true, we do not find in his works discussions of detailed phylogenies linking living and fossil species, nor references to famous evolutionists like Jean-Baptiste Robinet and Lamarck. But we have to see Goethe in historical context. 19th century evolutionists were rarely equipped with the most convincing phylogenies. Darwin was ridiculed for some of his, and Goethe wrote d decades earlier. We know that Goethe endorsed evolution with intimate friends like Schelling, and references to species descent by Kant and Edouard Dalton met with cautious written approval. The crucial consideration for him was political. Delicate public treatment of sensitive subjects was a matter of principle. He followed what he called the higher maxim of pedagogy, not to disturb children or the half-educated in their reverence for higher things. He, d he intended his scientific essays to provoke thought rather than to argue a thesis or declare scientific victory over religious opinion. The playwright never forces ideas on his audience, but lets them draw their own conclusions from the dialogue and the scene. Goethe generally leaves the idea of evolutionary descent implicit. But in some texts, it's hard to miss. His language seems rather to test our flexibility of mind as he intimated. Consider the study of, he made of rodents, the largest, most diversified order of mammals. With animals, one observes instinctive behavioral drives, quasi-Faustian strivings to supply the engine of change. For Goethe, the animal's activities spur their evolution. Georges Cuvier, the, permanent, the, the premier 
anatomist of the early 19th century, had called attention to the rodents' characteristic powerful teeth from which they get their name, rodent being the Latin word for gnawing. Their well-developed upper and lower incisors offer a dramatic example of how animals are determined by their mode of feeding. Goethe sees them brimming with nervous, grinding energy, taking their specialty to a Faustian excess. Quote, their teething is vehemently compulsive, unintentionally destructive, end quote. Yet it is also creative. The rodents incisors can develop monstrously, especially when unopposed by the teeth above or below. So look at, if you look at plate 7B, that's a real photograph copied of the, um, the teeth of the vole, you can see, which is kind of like a field mouse. Um, they get out of control. Goethe sees this physical tendency as reflecting the spirited behavior that enables the rodents to expand across the globe. Their gnawing gave rise to a capricious range of forms. As their superfluous energy finds employment in the business of life, it fills various needs such as digging burrows, storing food, and building dams. Rodents explore the possibilities for adapted living so thoroughly that their generic forms create a microcosm, a fractal image of the whole mammalian class. Rats correspond to carnivores. Hares resemble the ruminating cattle and deer. Rabbits at that time were initially um, classed as rodents. Beavers dwell like swine in the swamps. And finally, squirrels and flying squirrels can be compared to apes and bats, respectively. And indeed, bats and primates are closely related. Goethe's essay on rodents takes a bolder turn when he pauses to contemplate the common squirrel with its capacity to stand upright. In quadrupeds, he notes, there's a tendency for the hind parts to lift themselves above the frontal ones. But a contrary frontal elevation occurs in such capital animals, he calls them, such capital animals as the lion and the elephant, whose raised heads are further emphasized by ornament. He calls this unexpected elevation a striving, using the Faustian word, bestreben. Now among the rodents, he observes, it is the ape-like arboreal acrobats, the squirrels, that have approximated an upright bearing. They grasp, they grasp nuts and spruce cones with skillful hands, and as they play mischievously with their food, we delight in watching them. Then Goethe imagines the emergence of an archetypal city of squirrels, like the city of pigs that Socrates and Glaucon construct in Plato's Republic. Quote, gnawing promotes a superfluous consumption of food for the purpose of material filling the stomach and might also be regarded as continuous exercise, a restless urge to be occupied, which may ultimately lead to destructive fighting. After satisfying immediate need in the liveliest way, they would still like to have, they would still like to live in more secure plenty. From this arises the gathering drive and the handling of materials, which might appear to be very similar to deliberate artistry." End quote. Again, one might ask about the scientific value of this reflection on the squirrel as a mirror of man. But again, one has to remember that Goethe is on the lookout for broad proto-human trends in the living world. Note that with respect to the upright posture, frontality represents a contrary tendency in nature, a vertical redirection of the animal's horizontal nutritive impulse. A literally new horizon opens up. Goethe discovers the frontal elevation in several orders, not just the primates. So instead of treating uprightness as a singular theme among the anthropoid apes, he links human posture to a vector throughout the animal kingdom. It is the reverse of anthropomorphism. Man is literally on more equal footing with other life forms, but without, if you pardon the expression, without a loss of standing. The same goes for his little history of the squirrel's collective life. The secret of our fascination with other forms lies in our obscure sense of kinship 
We are connected to them through feelings and activities that we recognize, greed, warlike behavior, the manual arts. These are functions of a pre-conscious but visible drive, a zoological version of Eros. For Goethe, animal access is not confined, as it is in contemporary sociobiology, to quantitative reproduction or quantitative reproductive competition. He mistrusts such mathematical abstractions. Vital drives connect humans to nature by a more palpable bond. We may not know the genetic factors of species radiation, nor do we need to attribute a goal to any particular evolution, but the exuberance of life is the cause of development, and that can be seen everywhere. We simply have to expand it imaginatively through geological time. We think evolution with the mind's eye. In this fashion, Goethe does speculate a little comically about phylogeny, and he does entertain the descent of humans. The topic comes up in the middle of an insignificant looking paper on sloths and pachyderms. Pachyderms are tough skinned mammals like the whale. They're no longer in an order, um, but they were in Goethe's day. He asks permission to resort to poetic expression and he launches into an evolutionary fable. The story begins with a colossal spirit, that's what he calls it, a beached whale, a mammalian fish out of water. This Proteus from the sea regrets its uncertain fortunes even as it begins to settle in its swampy home. Quote, it feels as if it belongs half to earth and half to water, end quote. Its inner turmoil passes quote, through whatever filiation to its descendants who make their way into the new environment, end quote. But they are hard pressed to develop harmoniously. As if vexed by some former constraint, as if impatient to exercise some freedom, he continues, they stretch out their limbs and grow claws, almost without limit. These new beasts are the sloths a group in which he discerns a counter spirit, an ungeist. But the claws are destined for something more, he says, a principal appearance, Haupterscheinung is his word. They're destined for a higher appearance, like when the hero, when the hero comes into its own, his own. Actually, some of the genus, the sloth genus, get it together, and they become the unau, the two-toed species of sloth, highly sensitive. Soon they enter the scene as the veritable mobile apes. These apes have a great calling, Goethe says, although still unfulfilled. He closes his tale with a quick but arresting phrase, and among the apes, surely there are a few that might show their way to their future destiny. We would be missing the point if we took Goethe's fanciful planet of the apes either too literally or too lightly and overlooked the occasion for self-reflection that evolutionary thinking might offer. His sequence of images tells a Faustian tale. <coughs> Painful birth and ambivalence about life, slothful inactivity and withdrawal from the task of adaptation, unproductive vexation, and finally the beginning of a resolution, simian activity that will eventually realize the potentials hidden within. The moral is not dissimilar to Goethe's little drama about rodents. What at first seems like monstrosity and maladaptation turns into creative opportunity. Here, the whale's maladjustment presses him on to a nobler destiny. The ascent of higher animals stretching across eons of evolution thus discloses a history of spirit. But why does Goethe choose the whale? and the sloth as human progenitors. These are suggested in an odd way by the science of his day. His phylogeny incorporates genuine zoological problems. Both the whales and the sloths are among the most difficult animals to classify. 
Only in modern times has the whale been made a mammal. In evolutionary discussions during the 19th century, zoologists doubted whether this superbly adapted sea creature without hind legs could possibly have descended from a four-legged land dweller. Even today, the classification of whales remains in dispute. Yet despite their causing taxonomic trouble, the whale's social structure and high intelligence have always been admired. One hardly needs reminding that the cachelo, the blunt-headed sperm whale, was a spiritual adversary of seafaring mankind at the turn of the 19th century. Cuvier's editors recorded its bloodthirsty tyranny of the sea and its vindictive pursuit of prey. It has scarcely any parallel in animated nature, they said, ironically, cognizant of the excesses of the whaling industry. The sperm whale and man, Moby Dick and Ahab, are natural Faustian characters. Similarly with the sloths. They are also great eccentrics of zoology, animals that, like whales, defied the authority of the classifiers. Cuvier called the sloths imperfect and grotesque because they violated his rules of how the parts of animals should be functionally correlated. These depressive tree hangers were thought to lead a painful existence. Hence Goethe's label, Ungeist, a negative instance of spirit. But his claim that sloths are destined for something more is not far-fetched. Some sloth species are good swimmers and have dexterous hands. Look at the anthropoid stance of the sloths pictured in the early edition of Cuvier. That's plate six. I don't know what they were thinking, but they look like little people, don't they? Um, in brief, the ancestors Goethe selects for humankind have curious credentials, though perhaps ones that only the author of Faust might have noticed. Sloths and whales are natural outcasts of nature and outlaws of scientific legislation. In Goethe's mind, they illustrate what is most important to see about man, not just his archaic tool making or cooperative hunting as evolutionists emphasize today, but his exile and eternal self-dissatisfaction. So much for my sketch of Goethe's botany and zoology. He knew the scientific establishment of his day would have a hard time assimilating his methods and discoveries. As I mentioned, he saw himself as a natur anschauer, nature's presenter, its stage manager. His situation with respect to the science of his time makes, makes one think of that whale stranded on the shore. The poet may be out of his proper milieu, but it's not easy to get around him. Later scientists like Darwin and Claude Bernard obligingly cited his particular insights, but the scope and originality of his vision was rarely appreciated except by other German thinkers. That holds true today as well. What can we learn from this Leviathan of the life sciences? Here comes the scary part. Let me approach this question by focusing on the crucial difference in effect, a metaphysical divergence between Goethe's project and modern biology and say how I think it came about. We live this side of the Darwinian revolution. So some comparison with Darwin may be in order. The idea of theory is critical here. Goethe and Darwin understood different things by it. For Goethe, theory is closer to the ancient Greek idea of theoria, which refers to seeing, beholding the phenomena. Theoria is etymologically associated with the word and the concept of theater. Darwin, by contrast, thought of theory according to a modern paradigm. For him, theory was associated with the Newtonian model of a universal law. Newtonian law, Establish an, establishes an abstract mathematical principle behind the phenomena, a power like universal gravity from which the manifold phenomena can be deduced as its necessary consequences. Explanation in Victorian science followed, was, it was mediated by this model. Darwin, 
you must forgive the hasty summary, Darwin took Malthus's overpopulation calculus, the struggle for existence, as the mathematical principle from which to deduce, in Newtonian fashion, the sorting out of better adapted individuals, thus defining evolution. As you can see, reductionism is implicit in the procedure. The phenomena must be submitted to an abstract quantitative law. The visual experience of organic forms, their extravagant variety, their weird inventiveness and gradations of soul, everything that was primary for Goethe must become mere secondary effects for Darwin. That is, if he is right, that they are simply products of the struggle for existence. But is he right? Why do biologists hold the reductive interpretation to be true? I doubt that they are reading The Origin of Species to validate it, though Darwin was the one who had to come up with the demonstration. For students of Darwin's original texts know that he, he had a hell of a time making his case. Remember that in order to make the struggle for existence appear to have diversifying results, to radiate in new species, Darwin called his theory natural selection on analogy with the human technique of selective breeding that makes new varieties. But the analogy fails. The human breeder is guided by intelligence and Darwin's point is to make evolution the effect of a mindless population mechanism. He didn't see that his analogy begs the question. Why? Because unlike our later Darwinians, he had in his mind a conventional parallelism between human and divine artistry. In fact, a little known fact, Darwin's supreme confidence in natural selection was thoroughly conditioned by theism. You see, historically, as the Newtonian deductive program expanded in the sciences, it congealed into a broad and abstract theology of creation. Everyone in Darwin's circle, all the scientific bigwigs that he wanted to convince of the genealogical descent of species, expected such a claim somehow to fit with the Newtonian vision of a wise and lawful creator. Darwin too. For him, this would be a creator who rather than fashion each species, designed the law that enabled them continually to adapt. His quest was for what he called God's magnificent law. The theological context thus supported his belief when he discovered natural selection that Eureka, he had found the supremely ordained law of creation. Creation or evolution must simply be adaptation. He then pitted his, this alleged higher law of creation, natural selection, against the postulate of multiple special creations and argued its superiority in explaining, that is deducing, all the phenomena as a matter of adaptation. But that makes the claim that evolution is mainly natural selection merely polemical. In short, Darwin's demonstration had more of the prestige of Newtonian science than the rigor and certitude. Darwinism rested on a belief in a unifying abstraction, a likely story to borrow Timaeus's expression. For no one knew how to gauge scientifically the extent to which natural selection had actually determined all the evolved forms. Darwin has simply practiced viewing them through the lens of fitness. Their evolutionist critics objected that a handy explanation was not the same as science. On their view, natural selection left a serious explanation gap. For natural selection only asserts that living beings, all evolutionary paths, must meet the physiological bottom line, competence at survival, the condition of every organism's existence. How do we know, they asked, that the differential selection or sifting of populations has played the decisive role, the most creative role throughout the history of life? Why shouldn't other drives and forces have come into play to elaborate new forms wherever the basic level of survival was assured? Of course, this was the whole point of Goethe's Faustian morphology. Diversity of form arises from striving powers latent in any successful type. 
form and drive are not simply reducible to functionality and adaptation. Now Darwin's and Goethe's views of evolution might be compatible, that is a deep problem, but their methodological approaches were decidedly different. In reading Goethe's comparative morphology today, we are witnessing the classical idea of form, the visual inquiry into what beings are, come into ideological conflict with our current evolutionism that levels beings under a quantitative law. I trace this conflict to the opposing attitudes toward the Newtonian regime in England versus on the continent. On the English side, as we just saw, Darwin's enthusiastic overestimation of the mechanism of natural selection was dictated by the Newtonian theology of design. Goethe is a whole other story. He attacked the Newtonian establishment the way the Parisian insurgents stormed the Bastille. No nature researcher could have been more hostile to a total mechanistic law, God's or man's. We can see what difference this attitude makes by considering the question of chance. Whereas calculating the chances necessary to produce man became an embarrassment for the law-abiding Darwinians, Goethe thought of the evolution of higher animals playfully as a cosmic gamble, a long game that nature played against herself. He wrote, quote, in the marine animals, nature was already feeling her way toward the higher idea of land animals. You can imagine nature standing at the gaming table, constantly shouting double and continually to play with her winnings in all her domains. The mineral, the animal, the plant, after a number of lucky throws, they are all put at stake again. And who knows, but that man himself is not in his turn, just another throw for higher, higher winnings." End quote. For Goethe, chance and risk-taking were a necessary part of all striving through higher stages. No single quantifying mechanism could capture the unpredictable explosions of form in the history of organic types, let alone the nobler attainments. Such an external law would mean glossing over nature's many capricious developments, that's his word. Goethe was concerned with deep chance, the occasions for higher forms to manifest themselves, not mere statistics, potentialities, not probabilities. His evolutionary conjectures were specific dramas, each with its own cast of characters. Remember his rodents. For him, such reconstructions from past eons are necessarily acts of narrative imagination. Imagination, he would say, is still active, even when it is co-opted by a physical model of explanation and framed by a theology of design. He would see the higher principles that Darwin relied on, the double mediation of Newton and Christianity, as unfortunate ideological biases. These set up a scientific worldview, which is different from science. Advocating a single general perspective on evolution, a mindless mechanism at that, must also obscure the human connection, alienating scientists from the world they study. It must further entangle the Cartesian mind in paradoxes about its relation to the whole. If we are not vigilant about how method and metaphysics tempt, tempt us to simplify reality and project a worldview, then we risk losing our intuition about our kinship with being. It was that intuition of deep kinship with nature that Goethe's essays had cultivated. Near the end of his career, as he looked back on his work, his reflections insinuated some advice to future naturalists. He cautioned about an unself-critical relation to method. In place of any single imposing model of explanation, he referred to plurality and flexibility of approach. And now I have a long quotation from his introduction to his collected morphological studies. It's, when a, it's a very powerful passage. When a man of lively intellect first responds to nature's challenge to be understood, he feels irresistibly tempted to impose his will upon the objects he is studying. Before long, however, they make him realize that he in turn must acknowledge their might and hold in respect the authority they exert over him. He becomes aware of a twofold infinitude 
in the natural objects of the, of the diversity of life and growth and the vitality of interlocking relationships, in himself of the possibility of endless development through always keeping his mind receptive and disciplining it with new forms of assimilation. New forms of assimilation. Given how steeped Goethe was in earlier traditions of nature philosophy, one wonders if he wasn't thinking also of the old forms of assimilation that he had made new again. For the themes in his work all have an ancient ring. Certainly the classical doctrines of form and potentiality and the idea that the living body expresses a soul. His notion of sexual forces that oscillate like yin and yang ascending to the conjunction of opposites has an arcane history. The plant's metamorphosis between earth and ether resembles an alchemical distillation. So the last plate you have on your page is, is a drawing of the plant archetype, which I have um, mischievously compared to diagrams and treatises on alchemy, which were probably read by the young poet. We know that he, he studied that stuff, that stuff seriously. Goethe's conception of species change brings to mind the most archaic of cosmological speculations, Anaximander's doctrine of the aperon, the unlimited or unbounded. In Goethe's zoological essays, the aperon shows up as the irrepressible drive, always breaking out, spilling over, now and again reined in by a counter drive that imposes a limit. The pr this protein energy, whenever it is restrained by form, constitutes a type of beauty. To him, these principles were not just the results of one chosen method, his personal form of assimilation. They constituted a whole neoclassical philosophy of becoming. So I wonder, did Goethe's reflections on method imply a, con a genial compatibility between the classical approach to the life world and modern biological research? Or did he suspect deeper, a deeper metaphysical antagonism, an antipathy of worldviews between the ancient inspired naturalist and the modern scientist? Was he perhaps resigned to the student of morphology, becoming a species of scientific heretic, banished to the margins? There is a curious scene in Faust part two that speaks to this question. It suggests that Goethe took special pride in having found a path for the independently minded, or should I say contrarian, researcher. That was a joke. Yeah. Okay, local one, but that's a, you know. At a crucial moment, Mephistopheles is forced to admit to Faust that his instrumental magic has its limits. He has been concealing from Faust the fact that there are higher powers than himself. Significantly, these higher powers are certain Grecian heroines whom the devil can't abide. Speak, says Faust, and do not fiddle, Mephistopheles responds. I loathe to touch on more exalted riddle. To these goddesses space is naught and time is less. The very mention of them is distress. They are the mothers. The mothers, Faust echoes. Such a strange word is said, Mephistopheles. You should feel the deepest dread. Incidentally, Goethe got the myth, mythic title, The Mothers, from an essay on Plutarch, an essay of Plutarch. Here he makes them the possessors of the secrets of form. Mephistopheles describes their work. There is no rule, as it may chance, Formation, transformation, the eternal mind's eternal recreation. Faust's demon doesn't want to be laid off by his human employer, so he tries to discourage him. When Faust asks him the way to the mothers, Mephistopheles describes the terrible void the traveler would have to brave in order to reach their heathen dwelling. This is Mephistopheles. There is no road into the unreachable, the inaccessible, unbeseechable. That prospect ought to change your mood. Can you conceive of wastes of solitude? 
Moon and stars revolve in harness, but there you see nothing, only vacant farness. But Faust will not be intimidated. He finally sees through Mephistopheles. He decides to journey without him to the, uh, to the goddesses of form. Leaving his demon behind, Faust declares, you speak your part of mystagogue in chief, trying to bring simplicity to grief. Well, I'll try it out. Whatever may befall in this, your nothingness, I hope to find the all. Thank you.